Okay, hello everyone. Are we good to start? Everyone's good? I have everyone's okay at the start time. Rachel, are we good to go? Karen, okay, great. Um, thank you everyone, uh, as Karen said, for your patience. Appreciate everyone uh, being here today with us. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of make my beginning words quicker because we're running a little behind so we have enough time for everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, we're looking forward very much to this program today uh, about the Mayor's Office of Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing, M-O-D-D-H-H. -D -D I don't know if you guys have a, a way to say that or is it always M-O-D-D-H-H? -D -D -H? If, if there's a quicker way, let me know. Um, please. I'm Judy Alden. I'm president of HLIA DC chapter currently. And our programs, as many of you know, who, who come to these monthly programs, uh, we always offer cart captions. However, uh, ASL is kindly being provided by the MODDHH. So this is kind of a, a new thing for us because um, the vast majority of people who are hard of hearing don't use ASL, but we want to be inclusive and accommodating. So thank you, MODDHH, for providing the interpreters. Um, let's quickly review, although I think we're probably, we're all on the same page, right? Everybody knows how to use Zoom. Everyone who needs captions has them. If not, raise your hand or put it in chat. I need to go through all those things. Click on the, okay, great. And everyone who needs ASL has it, right? Quick checklist to be sure that we are allowing accessibility. Great. Okay. Um, I'd appreciate it very much if you would turn on your video so we can even, even virtually create a sense of community and, and see one another and, uh, and uh, uh, turn off your mic until you, you want to say something and you're acknowledged. Thank you very much for that. that, that. Okay, my pace okay? All right, good. Um, I'll leave how to handle questions to Karen. Karen Quinones is Deputy Director of MODDHH, and she'll be leading today's presentation with her team. So Karen, I'll leave it up to you how you wanna handle any questions. Um, as you may know, MODDHH was established two years ago, 2022, with a mandate to make DC accessible for those of us who live, work, or play in DC um, in the various hearing loss communities, deaf, deaf, blind, hard of hearing, uh, light, deaf, and deaf, disabled, and so forth. Uh, HLAA and DCAD, DC Association of the Deaf, the deaf community, uh, uh, allied and partnered for many years to establish this office. You know, it had to go through council, it had to go through the mayor a couple of times, get budgeted and to serve these constituents. So we're, we're really look forward to understanding what's happening with MODDH at this point in time and looking toward the future. Just a qu few quick announcements. Uh, first, HLAA's major annual fun event and fundraiser is the Walk for Hearing. Uh, our chapter team is led by Rachel Stevens, uh, chapter VP and also uh, head of our chair of our activities chair. Chair Rachel, would you like to please talk about the walk, please? Yes, thank you, Judy. So the next DC Walk for Hearing will take place on Sunday, October 27th. And this year it's going to be at Glen Echo Park. So not at the National Harbor where it's been the last few years, but this is also a really great location uh, and if you haven't been there before, definitely come and check it out. Uh, we hope that you can join us on October 27th with our DC chapter team. And I'm going to include a link in the chat to sign up for our team. Even if you're unable to make it that day, um, feel free to make a donation. Other donations go towards uh, helping our ability to have programs like this, prov uh, provide cart, and it also helps just keeping our uh, chapter operationally functioning for the remainder of the year. So it's uh, very important to uh, our survival as a chapter and we appreciate any support that uh, you might be able to give. So uh, 
take a look for that, for the link in the chat. And uh, thank you, Judy. Thank you very much, Rachel. I've attended many, many of these walks and they're fun, you know, for families. Uh, I'm almost 80 to my two-year-old grandson last year. And if you haven't been to Glen Echo, it's one of my favorite spots. It, it's a, it's a uh, revived, um, used to be the end of the rail line in DC, a revived amusement park. And it's just charming. Just a great, great place to have wonderful memories made. So thank you, Rachel. And uh, Rachel, you're going to, you're going to put it, you're going to post how to get information. Great about that. Um, uh, also a timely reminder, as Rachel alluded to, is, is your involvement in the chapter regarding our sustainability. Uh, to get more information about chapter activities, uh, about the walk, about uh, recently, actually, we did a webinar with our chapter officers describing their roles and all the things they do and opportunities for volunteer tasks, everything from simple one off things to to stepping into leadership roles. So I did post that link in chat also. It's hlaadc.org. I would commend you to take a look at that. Our, our website is renewed and, it, and it's very user friendly. Uh, I also posted an address from one of our members who members who is giving away free Rayovac uh, batteries for your hearing aids. Uh, Mark, just contact. It's in the it's in chat. Contact him and arrange how to pick it up or have him deliver it or whatever. Very thoughtful. He has a new hearing aid, so he doesn't need the old batteries. They're six seventy five, which are not cheap. Um, I'll also want to say last but not least, I'm I'm really pleased to announce that Russ Mischeloff, past chapter president, has been appointed to the MODDHH Mayor's Advisory Committee. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, applaud for that. A uh, wonderful way to help guide this organization. Uh, also on today's call, I see, I think, and correct me if I'm mistaken, two other folks who have been appointed to that important committee, commission, committee, I guess it's called a committee. Um, Elvira Sisolak, whose name I hope I didn't mispronounce, forgive me if I did. And, uh, and uh, uh, Trudy Shaw, who is chairing that committee. So thank you everyone for your very valuable volunteer efforts uh, to guide MODDHH activities. With that, Ross, I will turn it over to you, please. Thank you, Judy. Um, and let me add my welcome. Thank you all for, uh, you know, for attending. One further announcement. Um, our next program will be on the 9th of June. It will also be uh, virtual on the Zoom. Um, and it will feature... Um, Larry Medwood, Dr. Larry Medwedski, some of you may know Larry, I think he might. Um, and he's going to be talking about advances in both hearing aids and cochlear implants, uh, features including wireless connectivity, artificial intelligence, the pairing of hearing aids with various apps. Um, these are all features, you know, which I think can significantly enhance uh, your listening experience. Um, so this is a program I think, you know, that uh, should be of great interest, you know, to all. And those of you who are on our mailing list uh, and announce for that program and how to join that program will be going out in the course of the next couple of days. Um, and so, uh, in any event, you know, I, I hope you'll attend because I think this one will be will be very, 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 very interesting. OK, enough for that. Let me just very uh, quickly introduce our uh, featured speakers, you know, for the day. Uh, they are all senior staff of the Mayor's Office of Deaf, Deaf, Blind and Hard of Hearing, M-O-D-D-H-H. Uh, Karen Quinones is Deputy Director. Sean Norman is program coordinator, and Jacqueline Ting is policy analyst. 
Together, they comprise MODDHH's community engagement team. And they're here today to talk to us and tell us about the office's activities and initiatives that enable, uh, that aim to advance the civil rights of deaf, deaf blind, deaf disabled, hard of hearing and late deafened DC residents and to enhance the quality of life for all who live, work, and play in DC, um, especially as it relates to communications accessibility. And with that, I will turn it over to our presenters. Thank you for being here. Uh, we all look forward, you know, to, uh, you know, to this conversation. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. All right. Well, as a welcome, um, yes. Oh, let me, oh, we lost our interpreter. Hold on a second. Desiree, are you still going? Do you want me to pop on? I was just going to voice. Do you want to still sign? You turned your camera off. Okay. I'm going to voice. I'm going to keep my camera on so Karen can see me. All right. So this is Julie. Um, she shared our announcement, or I plan to share as well, but um, she sent me a message to do it. So I wanted to first congratulate Russ, um, as Judy said, and Elvira, and uh, Prudence as well for serving on our advisory uh, committee commission. We're so excited to work with them. We've worked with you closely. I'm excited that the three of you now will be representing our office as well. So it's so nice of you to represent both MODDHH and um, the Hearing Loss Association as well. So congratulations. Thank you so much for inviting us to present today. Uh, your time on a Sunday afternoon, I would love do. I wish I could meet each one of you and introduce, And but for time's sake, um, we're going to go ahead and move forward. Hopefully, we'll be able to collaborate a little bit more later on, maybe in person as well. So I'm going to go ahead and start uh, my screen share, and then we will move forward. If at any time you have questions, go ahead and use uh, the raise hand feature uh, with Zoom. You can click on that on Zoom and just raise your hand and I will call on you or that will give me a heads up visually to be able to see that. And you can also ask questions in the chat as well during the presentation at any time. Any questions before we begin? Seeing none, okay. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And this is the interpreter. Kelly, can I get co-host ability, please, so I can pin? Thank you. Just give me one second. This is Kieran. Okay, is everybody able to see my screen? Great. Okay, so just this opening um, screen, the Mayor's Office of Deaf, Deaf, Blind, Hard of Hearing, all of our names there. Okay, so before I go ahead and move forward with our presentation as far as how um, we are involved with the community, I wanna give you a little bit of our background on who we are as um, human beings. Um, obviously we work for MODDHH, but also our experience with hearing loss is personal as well. So I wanted to explain a little bit about our individual experiences and our background um, because we all have diverse backgrounds. So I will go ahead and start with myself. Um, I identify as a deaf individual. I was born to a deaf into a deaf family. My parents are deaf. 
And my uh, deaf parents used ASL as their primary language. So that is my first language. I've used sign language my whole life growing up. I grew up, I went to, I was mainstream. So I went into um, a public school. I used interpreters and most of the time I was typically the only deaf student in my classroom. So I was used to that experience growing up. Uh, I went to Gallaudet University for one year and then I transferred to Cal State University in Northridge. And that's where I graduated uh, with my bachelor's degree. From there, I eventually went back to Gallaudet University for my master's degree. I got my master's in social work. And yeah, I guess that's pretty much my story. So I grew up um, in collaborating and, and socializing in the hearing world, using interpreters, using CART. I remember being in college, uh, in our college classroom, and I would often request ASL interpreters as well as CART. Uh, so I love CART because I think it takes notes for me. <laughs> it was my note taker instead of me constantly having to watch the interpreters and take notes. I could fully be present watching the interpreter and then they would send me the cart transcript uh, after the class and I'd be able to read and review. So it was a huge advantage that I had. So I absolutely loved having um, accessibility to both of those. Uh, so that's my story. I'm gonna hand it over to Sean. Hello everyone. My name is Sean. And I am from Illinois, Chicago, or Chicago, Illinois. Um, I was born hearing, and then I became deaf when I was two years old. My family uh, was a hearing family, uh, but they did learn sign language. I went to a deaf program at a hearing school growing up in K through 12. Um, and then um, I actually went to five, four or five different colleges. Um, most of those colleges had deaf programs there, um, and I did use ASL interpreters. I used ASL interpreters growing up my whole life uh, as well with school. Then I transferred to Gallaudet University. I graduated my master's degree in um, physical education. Uh, so I grew up in both worlds, the deaf world and the hearing world. So I'm very familiar in, of navigating both of those. Um, most of the hearing, um, you know, they would sign or we could take notes. Um, I felt like there was no barriers being able to communicate with my friends. We could text back and forth. I feel very comfortable navigating that communication with hearing people. So that's that's my life story and my experience. Okay, we'll hand it over to Jacqueline. Hi, hello everyone. My name is Jacqueline. This is my sign name, Jacqueline. I grew up in California, Fresno, California. I was mainstreamed as well. Um, I kind of fall between hard of hearing, deaf hard of hearing. Um, my aunt and my uncle uh, were on my dad's side of the family were hard of hearing and had hearing loss as well. Um, I grew up, my first language was English. Later in life, I went to Gallaudet. I was re the recruitment team contacted me with Gallaudet my senior year of high school. And I was able to visit and tour the campus. And I ended up going to Gallaudet and learned sign language um, during my college experience. So I was part of their jumpstart program, um, being able to do sign language and to be able to learn and uh, the acquisition of the language during my college years. Um, same as Sean. Um, I've been involved in both worlds, signing community as well as uh, the hearing community. My dad's uh, family does not know sign. So uh, when I go home, unfortunately, I have to rely a lot on technology, limited technology. Growing up in school, we used an FM system where I would, you know, use hang that around my neck and I'd have to navigate both worlds uh, using that. At Gallaudet, I majored in psychology and public health. And then I got my master's degree in public administration. Um, now I'm in a certificate program as a paralegal. Uh, so I'm studying that uh, in my free time. Uh, and that's about me. Perfect. Um, great. So Jacqueline, I wanted to ask you, growing up, did you have interpreters in school or 
No, this is Jacqueline. I was just, yeah, Karen saying, I wanted to see what kind of access you had. Yeah, this is Jacqueline. No. And when I was mainstream, I wasn't familiar, you know, as far as requesting interpreters, having access to interpreters. Um, Karen saying, did you have cart access? No, you didn't have anything. This is Jacqueline. No, I had no access to cart. No, my accommodations in essence were you sit in the front of the classroom. We're going to put you as close to the front as you can, and you're going to use your FM system. Um, and that's it. That's pretty much, I had hearing aids, but I had no cart. I had no ASL interpreter. I didn't even know about that until later when I went to Gallaudet, I could learn about the different, you know, accommodations and as far as accessibility, what technology we had. So, yeah, this is Karen. So hopefully that gives you a little bit more of our personal background and experience. We'll go ahead and jump into the slides. Hold on, hold on one second. Desiree, do you want to switch or do you want me to keep going? Okay, we're going to switch interpreters just one second. Okay, thank you. Okay, so... Um... Our mission statement of M-O-D-D-H-H, um, I will let you all go ahead and read through that, um, if that's all right. So, um, yes, our mission, um, to put it briefly, I can't see the full screen, unfortunately, because I have, um, on Zoom, I have the, the, I have part of the features blocked because I'm using the interpreters and I'm having to share the screen. So it's a, but basically our mission of the office is to work closely with deaf, deaf blind, deaf disabled, hard of hearing individuals in the community um, around DC, as well as government officials to make sure that we can create opportunities and um, work within the different communities to get feedback and to hear people's concerns and what's working, what is not working, and to have that communication o open um, and to be able to facilitate that with our, with the government through programs and events and um, within our community. So with that work, the work that we do, um, our goal is to see um, communication access um, really be integrated within all these parts of our everyday life in DC, to have it be um, just integrated and to be able to go to different, experience different programs, experience different events, services, resources, activities, all of those things and have communication access already there. Um, that is our goal. Um, and in practice now, I have noticed that um, we still um, have to put in a lot of requests still. It is not automatic. Um, sometimes um, there are some areas of the government that do um, a really good job and that are automatically, um, you know, for the deaf, deaf blind community, they do have communication access there. And um, in often they don't, unfortunately. And now, we have to remind them and we have to put in that request. It is not, like I said, it's not automatic yet, but it is a work in progress. And I have noticed a lot of movement. Um, and it looks like we are having some good progress. And, but the most important um, aspect of this is the communication access. Any questions so far before I move on to the next slide? Okay.
All right, so in case you all have not yet, or if you're not familiar with our office yet, if you haven't come to any of our events or haven't socialized with us, um, I'll give you a quick, um, just a picture of, of what we do within our office in the committee. So we have a director and um, then there's the assistant deputy director, which is myself. Um, Carrie Cook is the director. And Keisha Gore, she is the chief of staff. And she knows Sean and Jacqueline as well, as you all have gotten to know them today. And um, our director of operations is Saeed Abdi. So if you all see us in the community, um, please say hello, come up and um, greet us, um, email us at any time for any of the needs that you have or any concerns or anything that you would like. We're very approachable. Okay. Um, also, um, the names of our staff members are there and next to there we have our values, our core values. And that helps us um, remind ourselves of the work that we do and why it's important to us and why we continue to do this work and advocate every day. Um, it keeps our expectations also um, standardized so that we keep ourselves accountable to to the community and the community um, for us. And we make sure that we continue progressing. And how many uh, of sorry. you are I'm familiar sorry to with- interrupt. I'm sorry, um, I, I just, I can't get, my video Desiree, is stay Desiree, on, I'm not working. But on um, Karen, on the last slide, I noticed that the photo had seven individuals, but only six names were listing. I think we're missing this woman to the right of Carrie Cook. Am I am I correct? Yes, that would be me. Oh, the woman next to Carrie? Um, that is our ASL interpreter. Yeah. But yeah. she has left the office. Yeah. She is no longer with us. So that's the person. Um, and that yeah. position is okay. actually vacant as well. We are okay. looking um, to fill that role currently. Okay. Thank Good you. catch. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. So also, um, so our office is part of mayor, the mayor's office of community affairs, um, which is MOCA. Um, how many of you are familiar with that agency? Raise your hand. Okay, I see some of you raising your hands. So basically, we represent the mayor. We are um, an, a, arm. A, a, an arm of the mayor. Um, and so we also um, are um, work within the community um, on behalf of the mayor. And so also our job um, must be um, parallel to theirs. Right now, um, our priority is education, the, as the mayor's is, um, public safety, hiring, um, revitalizing, um, revitalizing the community, revitalizing the downtown. downtown area, and in DC, because 
um, because since COVID, a lot of the offices and a lot of um, businesses are vacant and bef um, it's different than it used to be. So we're trying to, we're seeing a lot more, we want to see a lot more life in downtown, in other words. So um, that's our priority right now. But whatever we do, we also try to make, um, we we do everything parallel with the priority of the mayor's office. Okay, next slide. All right, so our office internally, we are one team and we always work together, but we also do have um, different roles and responsibilities within our own team, of course, um, like all other offices. Um, our, we have two divisions or we're divide up, uh, divided into two teams. One of the teams is our community engagement team. And the other is our um, communications accessibilities team. Effective communication program. Effective communication program. ECP. And I'll explain both of those teams um, right now. So uh, the community engagement team is kind of self-exclamatory. We do try to engage the community through programs and policies that we implement. And we go out into the community quite a bit and um, we work with community-based organizations who are deaf, deaf-blind, deaf-disabled, hard of hearing, and that we serve those communities and engage with them and partner with them and work together to improve the experience of our community every day in DC. And who runs the community engagement team? Um, it, we're here with you today. It's myself and Sean and Jacqueline. And um, we lead the team. And Sean does a lot of the programs, which means that he will often um, set up events or he will partner with um, the DC government agencies and um, that have different um, events, different fundraisers for education, for health, um, as well as just um, different programs. He'll partner with them depending on their missions and um, do events and services and make sure that all of those are accessible as well. He also runs our social media platform. Our social media platform, and he's responsible for that as well. Jacqueline, she engages the community through policy and procedures. And she will um, keep a lookout in the community for areas um, that need um, help and guidance um, with policy and procedures and make sure that the procedures, that the, gov the different government procedures are um, accessible for our communities. And really they keep our community in mind when setting up any sort of policy as well as the procedures. For example, regarding um, emergency preparedness in DC, um, we'll get an idea of what kind of policy and procedures and background they have. Desiree, we'll go ahead and switch. If you want us a break, we'll go ahead and switch. Okay, so we were talking about different types of programs, resources that we cover. Really, it's the whole spectrum from birth to senior citizen. We cover that whole scope of age. We also do have um, members internally um, that we prioritize. For example, we have youth, a youth program. 
We also have employment submit. We have deaf and deaf history month. Let me think of other ones. So, and those are kind of like our signature events uh, that will typically happen um, every year. We'll, we'll have those and keep those going. And we are open to expanding as well. Um, and I think that requires just communication, collaboration, partnership, as far as what that possibly could look like. But for now, we have those three that we prioritize and give our energy to. Also, um, I did want to mention as well, we have a safe program. Um, it's called Security Accessibility for Emergencies. Emergencies, so SAFE, S-A-F-E. That's also a really important project that we work on program. So yeah, I think that's about it. And I did want to say too that we are looking into um, our senior citizen program and also early intervention, an early intervention program. So those two are kind of still in the work, but I wanted to mention the four that we already have up and running successfully that we will continue to uh, work on and provide. All right, so let me see what's next. So as far as partnering with us, collaborating with us, contacting us, it's very simple. Uh, we can set up a meeting to discuss whatever your vision may be, how our office, our vision can work with your vision, how we can um, work in tandem together, different activities that we could do together. Sometimes we might be able to sponsor um, an event instead of maybe perhaps just working together. We could look at a sponsorship opportunity. So yeah, I think that's as far as our vision with our office and whatever organization uh, or individual would like to reach out, please do. I also wanted to mention as well, make sure that I lost the interpreter. Hold on one second. Um, okay, great. I got her back. It's hard with my screens. I wish I had two monitors here. That'd be that would be wonderful to be able to see everything clearly. I also wanted to mention a little bit about our communication accessibility. All events that we host, we do have control over what kind of communication accessibility we want to request. And we always request first ASL interpreters. Secondly, we also do PT. Um, pro, pro tactile interpreters. Uh, we also request CART. And then we also request a deaf interpreter. So typically we actually have four accommodations, four um, accessibility options, you could say per event. Now there's some events that we obviously do not host that we can't put in the request. Those agencies hosting those will put in the request on our behalf and they will request who knows? We don't know. Sometimes we might ha request ASL interpreters. Um, sometimes, you know, they might request CART. It just, it depends. And, you know, you get a variety. Often, though they are open to, they're not often open to community feedback. Um, it's more of like, okay, for example, if for accom accommodations for everyone, perhaps they might, okay, we're going to request an ASL interpreter. And perhaps those there are like, well, no, I wanted to go to that event, but they won't have cart for me. So it's your responsibility to contact the host agency and tell them that, hey, I want to specifically request cart. And then they would have to be able to request cart. So that would go through our office. This is Sean. Oh, so that, that so as far as the email, um, emailing them, we'd have to monitor to make sure that they are obviously meeting whatever request you submit as far as accommodation and accessibility. Do we have any questions so far before I proceed to the next slide? Yeah, I, I'd like to ask a question, you know, because communication, uh, accessibility. And, and if you wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind whoever speaking, could you use the raise hand feature so I could see who's speaking, if you don't mind? 
Um, sure. Okay, I'm so, I'm sorry. I can. Okay, sh should Is I go he on? Speaking or? as it's a vessel Michelha. Yeah, uh, he, I'm not he sure he's having speaking. trouble. He might have trouble with the raised hand, but it's Russell Michelha. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Sure. I mean, yeah, communication access. I mean, is is obviously something which is very much on our minds. Um. But the, the, you know, let, let, let me tell you, yeah, it, it's it's. Communication access, for one thing, is it, it seems to me is basically legislatively mandated under the Americans with uh, Disabilities Act and other legislation. Um, at the same time, you know, we have where we've had difficulties occasionally um, and communicated, you know, with MODDHH about them. We're sometimes told, well. The event that you're talking about is not one that's MODDHH sponsored. It's another organization and e another governmental organization. And each of the organizations has a different, different process and different procedures. In some cases, you have to request for example, uh, ASL or a card, depending upon what you need in advance. Um, what MOD in, in such instances, i.e. instances where we're talking about programs of other DC government organizations, DC government agencies, MODDHH can provide guidance on communication accessibility they can provide some training, but in each case, it's not mandated. It is at the discretion of the sponsoring office whether they want such guidance or whether they want such training. It, it just occurs to me, it just seems to me that because communication access accessibility is legislatively mandated, it would be helpful if MODD could take a more active, a more aggressive approach in instances where other government agencies are not providing or making it difficult to access accessibility provisions. And I'm just wondering whether that's a possibility because it seems to me that would be extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is Karen. So, yes, yeah, so we are very hands on with making sure that communication accessibility. I mean, I feel like we are, you may not see it, but we are. Uh, we are always in contact with different government agencies who are providing accessibility. We are reaching and contacting them. So we're working a lot behind the scenes to be sending out reminders, making sure that requests are being submitted, what kind of requests. So we are working quite a bit behind the scenes. Um, two things that you mentioned as far as trainings, you're correct. Yes, it is not required. Trainings are not required. However, um, what you can do as an organization is you are, you're able to reach out and contact maybe a commission member um, and let them know that you feel it is very important that this should be required by all DC government agencies. Um, that they should be required to take like a cultural competency training, period. Um, if you are able to reach out to them um, and advocate for that, I think that would be helpful, absolutely. Secondly, we have developed a um, an, an uh, efficient communication timeline, effective communication timeline, I'm sorry. Um, so, for example, we have kind of like a memo that will be sent out to all DC government agencies as a kind of like a heads up, as a reminder that communication accessibility is a requirement by law, not only just, you know, as far as in the DC, it's a national law. So having um, accessibility, um, being able to let them know that even as a government employee, I often find myself 
having to remind other agencies to put in a request. Well, hold on. I have to remind other agencies that I need an interpreter. If we're having a meeting, I have to constantly be reminding them and reaching out to them. I've learned that it is ongoing. It's a constant educational opportunity that we always have to be reminding people to put these requests in on our behalf for effective communication, effective communication requests, unfortunately. Um, so yes, if you could work with us and be as aggressive, and I know, I know you, you have been very um, forthright and, and adamant as far as sending out those reminders and requesting CAR and interpreters. And I appreciate that. And I, I want this to continue, but I, I don't know, I'd like to be able to see more collaboration more than, you know, just for just a lack of word. I don't want it to be blaming MODDHH of, oh, well, it's on them, you know, because if it's not an event that we host, for example, or if perhaps, you know, you have CART or maybe the host agency is, you know, they're not hearing from community members to put in the request. We need to be reminding them, I am more than happy to advocate and send that reminder as well to them to be able to provide CART at the time of the event. And that's what we do. We do that a lot. So my hope, hope hopefully that answered your question. But we, yeah, I mean, we are very hopeful with sending out this effective communication um, guidance, uh, this plan. Hopefully, you know, as soon as possible, we able to make some progress. Unfortunately, with our procedures, we are requiring lots of approvals, green lights from, um, you know, different, just the different approvals before we're really able to send this out to all the D.C. government agencies. So it's kind of in, in holding right now, but it will be helpful. This memo will be helpful. And if trainings were required, that would be helpful. I'm absolutely on the same page with you with that. I agree. Uh, Judy, did you have something to say? Hold on one second. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, you know, to Russ's point, I guess just in the moment, tactically, how would we know who's responsible since it's given kind of your purview, as I'm understanding it, when we react to an announcement of an event, how would I know who's responsible to make a request of CART? Mm -hmm. does, does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, so often, mm -hmm, yeah, often you will see on the flyer. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Often you will see on the flyer who is responsible. For example, um, with MPD, you'll see in an event flyer for them, it'll say Community Engagement Ac Academy. And then on there, I think, I think it's usually pretty clear um, you, that obviously they're the ones hosting the event and it will stay on there that the person uh, you can contact for more information, it'll have like a POC on the, on the flyer, the point of contact person. So you might have the logo, you might have the contact information, all of that there. So I'm not sure, um, hopefully that's not confusing. Hopefully that flyer is pretty, pretty clear. Uh, that M MPD would be the one hosting. Um, so as far as, I guess, not getting more clarity, would that would that make sense? Or if you have any other questions with that? Um, I guess, uh, I guess my confusion arises, MPD is a good example, um, which happened recently. It, it, you know, the whole cover announcement was M-O-D-D-H-H information. And there was one little small text about which I didn't see the first three times I looked at it about the person at the MPD to contact. So I'm finding oftentimes announcements coming from MODDHH with MODDHH lead information. How do I, I I'm still confused about how do I figure out if if I can to even share that with our heart of hearing community. And we have hundreds of people on our email list particularly what the MPD would be interested, how do I figure out 
you know, ASL is going to be offered, right? As it should be. How do we figure out if if CART is offered or how to get CART? I mean, I, for me, it's very confusing about who the go-to is, given as Russ indicated, apparently the, the ADA mandate, you know, is still kind of a work in progress to achieve that. And it's a very tactical question because some of this information I'd like to push out to our members, but I need to understand what's being offered. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, sure, sure. Yeah, and that's fair, absolutely. I think um, moving forward, perhaps what would be helpful is our office does a lot of resharing for example, we might see an event um, for the DC government and we feel, wow, that would be very benef beneficial for our community. So that event is designed for our community, which means for the deaf, deaf blind, deaf hard of hearing, uh, deaf loss, deaf, dis deaf, deaf, deaf disability, I'm sorry. So we will gather that information and share that with our community. And oftentimes that information is overlooked by our community members who perhaps don't follow the host organization's social media, you know, their their social media platform, they may not follow them. So we are kind of like the middleman. We gather the information, we pass it on to our community. So maybe through that resharing, it might be helpful if somehow maybe we very clearly state this event is hosted by MPV. If you have more questions about accessibility, please contact this individual and make it very clear who to contact. They would be more than happy to support you with your accommodations or accessibility and maybe just really lay it out clearly versus just relying on the flyer that was originally created by the host if that's not if that's not clear enough. So we may uh -huh. have to revamp it um, during our resharing process to make that information clear. Does that make sense? Um, thank you. That I think would be very useful because I do find a lot of resharing and uh, that sometimes doesn't tell me who's the go-to. And before I push it out, you know, that becomes important information for the hard of hearing community, particularly when ASL says it is provided. So that that would be useful just to, who, you know, who's the go-to in, in those cases. Another question, if I may, Where's the best place to look for information about MODDHH specific events? Mm -hmm, I mean, you do a lot mm -hmm. of resharing of community events, not all of which are of interest particularly to the hard of hearing community, but you know, I've been to your website, that includes a lot of events. A lot of Facebook stuff is kind of after the fact. Is 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 your website the best place to go to look for information that I can push out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I think to be honest with you, I think Instagram is probably the best place uh, to look for the most updated information with our office events and activities. And I know that Instagram may not be perhaps the most user-friendly um, in regards to your organization, or perhaps you might feel that maybe another platform might be better. And if so, please let me know. We can absolutely make sure to put in an effort to be able to make sure that we are posting stuff on another preferred platform as well. Thank you. I know personally, I don't do much on Instagram, but I'm a dinosaur. Uh, but I do make sure I check Facebook <laughs> to see what might be relevant. So thank you very much. That would be useful. Facebook. Okay. Sure. I will notate that. Okay. Yeah. And I think internally, we also are in the works and the discussions of trying to find another way that our events become mm, not, not accessible, but more, more um, advertised. We want to get the word out. Um, and I know that Instagram is not always um, the best for everybody. I want to make sure that everyone, as you know, as many eyes are being able to see that we want to reach as many individuals as we can. So I have seen other offices using Linktree, Linktree, um, and that's where you actually can put the information in, um, and it will actually link different events. Um, so you can actually use Linktree. So that would be like 
via our website. And so internally, we might be designing a link tree um, to be able to you access our website and be able to get more information. So that would be helpful for those who don't use Instagram. Thank you. I, I do think that our constituents are active on LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah, so this one is actually called Linktree. It's different than LinkedIn. Um, so Linktree is actually, it's a different platform. Um, it's like a web, it's a website. Um, so it'll have a link where you um, can actually post just a different link for events, activities, anything that's happening out in our community and our office would host that. So we would be posting all our events in one place. It's kind of like a one-stop shop. So it's called Linktree, not LinkedIn. It's different. Thank you for clarification. Sure, I, sure. I, I, can I follow up with a question? Um, I'm following Judy's. This is Wendy Pactor. I don't have my camera on. Sure, sure, yes, okay, yes, sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, um, I, I'm i with um, Judy and maybe Russ, that I'm also a senior. I don't use Instagram, I don't use Facebook. I try, I, I really try to limit my time online as, as much as I can. I've never even heard of Linktree, but as a DC government agency, um, it seems, I. I, the Department of Aging and Community Living has ways of um, getting information out to the community through the village, for example, the community villages, um, and the maybe the community list serves. Um, it seems that there are ways that you could be doing to get information out to communities rather than to try to make people go onto platforms. And, and this may be part of the, you know, you said that one of the things you haven't done yet and you're thinking about is senior initiatives. And it sounds like you haven't gotten to this yet, but it, it may be part of what you're about to think about. And, and none of the things that you mentioned are, in my case at least, and the people I know, um, we wouldn't be looking at Linktree or Instagram or Facebook unless we have Instagram, Facebook, if we have grandchildren, but those of us who don't, we don't look at it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, so just to clarify, so we do also have um, an email list serve. We do have that available and we do send out emails frequently. Um, those who are not on our list serve, please email me. I would be more than happy to add your name onto that list. We also have a newsletter as well. However, that newsletter, it only comes out once a month. So I personally don't think that that's probably just the most effective way to be able to get information just because sometimes, you know, it's a little delayed. It's only once, once a month. But yes, as far as getting an email, getting on our email list serve, that is very effective, I believe. So please uh, contact me, email me. I'd be more than happy to get your name onto that listserv. And uh, we'd be more mindful of making sure that we were sending information out weekly, keep you guys in the loop, keep you updated as far as activities, um, any initiatives that may be starting. So all of those details. Okay, and at the end of this presentation, I will be also sending out my email to you all um, for my personal email and also my um, link tree. Uh, information for the listserv. And information for the listserv.
Okay, um, I also wanted to mention that this will be an ongoing collaboration with every one of you. So please feel free to address all of your concerns with me. I appreciate this discussion and in hopes um, really of being able to do this more often and being able to work together and um, to give everyone the communication access they need, make sure that that's all met. It's so important. It's such an important part of um, myself personally, something that I need every day access, and it's a priority for our office. And I do recognize um, that MPD um, does put on their flyers, um, you know, that there is ASL services or to request ASL services. Um, so I understand the frustration of that ASL is already there, but no cart services. I do understand that, that, and I appreciate you all that mentioned that and that spoke up so that I can talk to um, and let MPD know that that's something that they're lacking uh, moving forward. And the next meeting is May 22nd, I believe it's a Wednesday. Yes, May 22nd, Wednesday. Um, it's our third session. So if any of you are interested, please contact them and um, we'd be happy to provide CART services for that. Okay, I'm gonna move on because we have definitely a lot more slides that we have to cover. Oh, I missed that. I think I already touched on this part um, also, but we do have an effective communications program that is um, ran by um, Keisha. And Saeed. Saeed. They both um, run this program and they work together um, with the DC government agencies for all activities and events, um, meetings and so forth um, that go on within DC, except for the courts, DC courts. We do not um, serve the DC courts. They have a separate um, contract that they work under. Mm -hmm. And that's the same with DC council they have their own um, service providers that they work with. So um, those are both, both of those um, are separate from our agency and our programs, but everyone else, um, all the different government agencies, they are through us. And they will be putting in a request. Um, so the requests that we receive, we um, satisfy those requests. If no requests are put in, then we unfortunately um, aren't, aren't aware of, of the need. Okay. All right, we'll move on to the next slide if there's no questions. Are there any questions? Okay, I'm gonna move, um, I'm gonna hand this over to Jacqueline and she will be discussing our SAFE or SAFE um, program and um, awareness and involvement um, with us, Jacqueline. And one second while I move, move, move. Just bear with us one second, we're just gonna pin her. The interpreter can see. All right. Hello. Thank you. Okay. And again, um, we have an emergency um, safety preparedness program called SAFE, Securing Accessibility for Emergencies. And the program is housed in different um, emergency preparedness requirements and trainings and all of the things involved with that. 
emergency management training is part of that. And the training is for government officials and for people that work in um, government agencies and offices. Hold on, just, I'm sorry, just one. So we have, so we work with like first, we work with first responders. We work, um, one second, Karen's asking Jacqueline if she could make herself just a little bit brighter. It's a little hard to see her hands for the interpreters. It's okay. It's okay. We can keep going. Okay. Are we good? Better. Okay, accessibility um, trainings for government um, agencies and organizations. We do use interpreters and we um, people that request interpreters, um, deaf, blind, deaf, hard of hearing, um, community members. And if the community member goes to an emergency um, shelter, for example, how to provide interpreting services for that person or cart services if that's needed. Um, the accessibility um, for cart, having that, um, so we I, so that we can identify where the need is and um, where they're going to go. Trainings, um, that's starting with um, DC of, often there was There's a law, there, I'm sorry, there was a lawsuit that DC government settled because they had sued in regards to an accommodation not being met. So we are currently now um, in the process of being able to help an agency uh, modify their current uh, materials that they have due to this lawsuit. We also have um, e, uh, ECP, um, where they can call and request services in emergency situations. Um, we have different vendors or providers ready that within one hour, they can fill these requests. So I typically monitor those emergency requests. Um, if you might have like DC might call on these this request um, and it's a very last minute request and I monitor those. We also have community focus groups. Currently we have two, the first, first one is, um, uh, we have a 911 focus group and then we have another one, active shooter, active shooter focus group. So we have the two of those that we're working on. We also have e um, effective communication access cards. They're pretty straightforward. We have uh, designed a card with different um, ideas identification as far as what communication you prefer. We explain your right to be able to get accessibility. Um, so currently um, we are in the approval process for those once that's finished, once those are finished and approved, uh, we will be distributing those to all of our community members um, to be able to um, use those out in the public um, as necessary or however they need. Again, so just a lot of collaborations uh, with our DC government agencies, our partners to be able to make their events accessible, training, being able to update their procedures, a lot of ongoing work, especially um, spotlighting public safety. And I wanted to add um, also um, for accessibility for emergency training, um, I wanted to let you all know that we do touch on the hard of hearing community as well. Um, for CART services, we do provide um, hands-on demonstrations of how to use CART and we do show um, how to use CART if somebody does require that, um, what that looks like, um, how it works. And we, pro we provide um, hands-on demonstrations for our partners. Um, and we try to talk to, you know, how to talk through the computer, how to, how it actually works so they can see how it works and realize, um, and, and so they can get an exposure to the CART services and understand that they're aware of how it works and the importance of it. Um, 
and we try to do that um, and in the community and also with the community with the communication cards um, we have hard of hearing identification cards as well where that shows that you know what that would require as far as closed captioning on the cards um, or that would require card or cap closed captioning so that we are definitely aware of our priorities and keeping the awareness on um, the different needs of our community every day and to add this is Jacqueline for accessibility emergency management training these are required um, by DC government agencies um, because of the settlement. So not, not all, not all. No, not all DC government agencies are um, required. Right, right. Yeah, so it's not all. Um, I know. Um, hold on one second. The interpreter missed the name. Say it again. Math. Mass care. Mass care. Task, task, MCT, mass care task force. Oh, task force, task force, task force. Right. And that involves who could you um, explain who that involves? Um, the mass care task force? Yeah, so it's called MCTF, mass care task force. That's the Office of Disability Rights, the Department of Human Services, DPR, Department of Parks and Recreation, uh, Parks and Recreation, H, um, Homeland Security, Emergency Management Agency, who else? Serve DC. So we have several within that within that classification. And again, that training is required because of the settlement agreement. So that um, is the power that the community has to call on um, people and to let them know that that is required, especially those two trainings, the accessibility to emergency management training, as well as um, cultural the competency. cultural competency training. Uh, the cultural competency training touches on um, different identities, um, different kinds of accommodations and accesses and needs, and how to request, um, and the laws that are required um, within the agencies to provide accessibility. Things like that um, are important in the training. Um, and other things that are not required at all. But for example, um, if we for required training would be for MPD, um, we provide training to MPD and DC council. And I'd like to say, is it those two? Is it just those two? I think so. Mm -hmm. um, but soon we will also provide that training to the Department of Parks and Recreation. So that's coming up. And we're going to try to get word out um, for more agencies to take part in these trainings. Also, there's another um, DC Health um, has requested that training as well. So slowly but surely, you know, we're, the numbers are going up as to who um, is taking these trainings, but not all of the agencies are required. Next slide. You ready for the next slide? Okay, so we have two focus groups that I mentioned. The first one is our active shooter focus group. This started about a few months ago. Um, we had an active shooter um, situation that happened in Maine, and this really impacted a community member of ours, a deaf and hard of hearing individual um, that lost a loved one. And so there was community gap when people um, you know, are injured and they have to be transported to a hospital, um, communication gaps, I'm sorry, not community gaps, communication gaps. And so MODHH reached out um, and was surveying, asking, hey, do you have any sort of active shooter training? This would be incredibly beneficial for us. Um, and so we, um, MPD, provided this training or we provided this training to community members um, of various identities. 
And we sat down with our focus group and uh, was able to receive a lot of feedback and modified MPD's slide. Their slide, their PowerPoint slide had about 60 slides in all. And they had one slide on disability, one out of 60. So when we have obviously emergency preparedness, it's very important to touch on heavily on disabilities and disability inclusion within that and, and the various needs, different communication preferences, different methods, it's very important not to just have one slide. That doesn't suffice. We need more than that. So we were able to modify MPD's slides to make it more visually um, accessible for this training and to have it make it a little bit more updated. And at the same time, we were able to make um, some additional PowerPoint slides with, with our office information. Um, we also have ODR, MPD, the deaf and hard of hearing unit. So we added a few other um, HSM, HSEMA. We added those few there you see on the slide. And we were able to talk about some disability access, functional needs. Um, it's called DAFNA. Um, so we, we were able to provide a lot more information. We were also working on uh, making more materials. So not only just PowerPoints to be able to sit and listen as far as a presentation style, but more materials as well to be able to pass out. So this is our first focus group. Our second focus group is our text to 911 focus group. Uh, DC does have a text to 911. It's through the Office of uh, Unified Communication. And so they are, they run the system, and so they have a form here uh, that you are able to collect data using your own experience. You can text using the text 911 service. You can provide your, your information, your experience. So with OCR, we have been coordinating, communicating with them as far as technology issues with delay and technology, maybe perhaps the system not working effectively. So we've been getting some information on that. And so we, if you are interested, you can use this QR code to be able to save the form. Okay, and I want to add also, you can also send out um, things, um, all the information that like for text to 911 form, um, we're gonna send out links to all of these um, different programs and services. Um, I wanted to, um, talk about text to 911. Um, I was talking with friends the other day and we were talking about, they were, they were asking whether the office was involved in that. And a friend himself who is deaf, he said, well, why does your, why is your office involved in that? And we use text to 911. Sometimes um, maybe we're not able to call and, um, and not everyone is able to text, it, you know, I'm sorry, I might be. Yeah, the text to 911 is applicable for anyone, not just deaf or hard of hearing. Hearing people can use it too. So he made a good point. Text to 911 can be applied to anyone um, in society. Um, anyone that is unable to use uh, the phone at that moment or anyone that is able to use text can use that. It is for everyone. So I wanted to um, just dis to talk about that and make sure everybody knew that that is something that everyone can use, it's not just for deaf or hard of hearing. Of course, we have an important role in that because of um, accessibility issues in our community, but I just wanted to definitely recognize that. And I think that more um, the offices are, um, the more people are aware of these services, maybe it'll add more, we can add more services in the future that are not always um, 
uh, you know, services that don't always depend on the need for hearing. Okay, yep, we can go to the next slide. So with the text to 911 focus group, uh, we were able, we in the past, we were talking about creating a flyer. So here, this flyer was developed by the Office of Coordinated Communication. Um, they were able to collect information on that, information as far as like language, creating visuals. Um, and so we wanted to give you a chance to get eyes on it. Um, feel free to drop any comments or feedback. I'm more than happy to share this flyer with you, uh, with you, Judy, and then you can send it out to the rest of the individuals. But I'd be open to hearing any feedback. Feel free to email me after you are able to glance at it. Um, and feel free to add that in the comment in the chat section as well. Oh, great. Can we move on to the next slide? Sure. Yep, I think we can go ahead. Go ahead. I can go, Desiree. So we've been talking a lot about public safety. So here you can see a little chart, and this is a list of DC agencies that we partner with. We want to make sure that public safety is accessible to our community. We also want to make sure that their policies, their procedures uh, are inclusive of our community. So yeah, so these are just different examples of agencies that we coordinate and we work with. So if you have like Jacqueline said, any feedback, any questions uh, in regards to these agencies, please contact and reach out, share any information. We work together. We're more than happy to be a liaison with these uh, agencies for you um, and to be able to uh, address any needs that you may have. And this is Jacqueline. One thing I wanted to add, it, we have served DC there on that list. Currently, it's in the discussion about making a deaf and hard of hearing friendly cohort for their program. It's called CRT, Community Emergency Response Team, CERT, C-E-R-T. And really this is a very in-depth emergency program, um, perhaps CPR, different emergency trainings, preparedness. So that should be coming in the fall. Again, we will share this information as we know more and gather more details. We will be sure to reach out. This is Karen. I also wanted to mention as well about DC, um, DC EFMSS, Fire Emergency Medical Services. You were talking about the alarm. Yeah, Jacqueline was mentioning the fire alarm. So this organization, this is Jacqueline speaking, has fire alarms for individual DC residents. It's a program. Um, right now, they do not have the funds, the inventory, I'm sorry, the inventory for um, the FM related alarms, but they do have just general fire alarms if you are a homeowner. The website they have does have a form that you would have to fill out um, and you'd have to just submit your address, your residence, your name, your contact information. And then with that, um, in, the hap in the future, when you fill out that form in the future, they, that would cover, we do cover accessibility with that. So if, you know, they come to your home, um, they install the smoke alarm. And then perhaps um, you have, you need like an interpreter or cart, you can use that on your phone. If you need access to that, we're more than happy to get you uh, set up on that as well if you need that accessibility when they come to your home for installation. Okay, next slide. Yeah, I have a, this is, oh, wait a minute, I have a question. Okay, this is, this is prudence. Okay, um, the, I forgot what it is now, the emergency or the fire emergency 
program. Okay, you say come out to your home. Does this organization, um, smoke alarm detectors, do they install like in, in a multifamily building, like an apartment building or a co-op or a condo building, do, will they come out and install strobe lights? Fire alarms, you know, for fire alarms, strobe lights. Yeah, this is Karen. No. So what Jacqueline was, yeah, Jacqueline, correct me if I'm wrong. Right now, what Jacqueline mentioned, they do not have the inventory of smoke alarm with the strobe light. Is that correct? They don't have inventory for that. They only have the regular fire alarms, the smoke alarms. So they are installing those in, into buildings for free. So if mm -hmm. you if that works, you're more than welcome to reach out. If you prefer the strobe light smoke alarm, still communicate that with us. We can start the process of filling out that request um, to be able to show the data as far as, okay, how much do we actually need inventory wise to be able to meet these needs? of how many requests with the strobe light we need. So the data, of course, is always what we need to be able to show the pertinence of this request, to be able to get more, or how to push forward policy, how to advance technology. So if you feel um, that you prefer a strobe light, yes, please still contact us, and we will document that. OK, OK. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, sure, thank you. Okay, so for this slide here, we're just talking about accessible technology in DC. Again, our goal is to be able to make DC as accessible as possible for our community. One way in order to do that is to um, look at the DC government building and to investigate which building has accessible technology and which building doesn't. You know, which kind of accessible, accessible technology is included, what might need to be added, modified. Jacqueline is currently working on um, a slew of things um, addressing different issues as far as technology in all DC government buildings. So I will hand that over to her, Jacqueline, to explain a little bit more on that. Yeah, so this is Jacqueline. So we have induction loop memos. What that currently is, is accessible technology here in DC, and it's for residents. Um, it's visual, uh, visually, um, it provides accessible technology. I'm sorry, it works with hearing aids. So it's very important that uh, we are pushing for this accessibility right now. We've been doing just a little bit research, a little bit more research and collecting data from our government agencies on this. Um, we've already implemented what we have currently and we will be making adjustments as needed um, and then moving forward from there as far as where adjustments and corrections are needed. We do have a survey uh, to be able to collect your thoughts, your experiences, your feedback about accessible technology in DC. Again, this QR code is available for you. I will also drop the link in the chat. Right now we are having, um, we're just taking time. Um, actually, if possible, we're gonna pause for a second for about five minutes. If you are able to fill out the survey, please do so. Or if not, feel free to do it later during your free time. Yes, uh, um, Karen, I want to ask Jacqueline or um, Judy, Russ, or wrestler Judy, um, what do you think is best? It, do you all want to collect your feedback on this? Um, do you think that we can go ahead and take five minutes, five or 10 minutes to do that now so we can fill out this survey? Or do you feel it's best to hold that until after the presentation and do it on your own time? 
Uh, Russ, your call, I would think perhaps later. May yeah, I have a I, question I, about I, these I uh, data collections and memos and surveys you're doing? Is that, are the results of those surveys, which would kind of drive any action around assistive technology? Yeah. Are those, where can we find that information? Is that being made available? A, a kind of a two-step, doing the surveys is great. Appreciated. Is that information going to be available? So I know if I walk into uh, pick up yes. the library, oh. Mount Pleasant Library, it's going to be looped. Yes, we will be sharing the results. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. I understand. Yeah, we, okay, so we absolutely definitely um we'll do a i don't know a recap a summary as far as the results of the survey after that then we will have to address the dc government building as far as what the results included so because of the survey itself the survey itself is not So if this is this is just we are gathering your experience, your personal experience. Um, for example, perhaps you went to the DC library or you went to another building. I want to see if the feedback we receive is standardized across all DC buildings, if this is a uh, is applicable to all DC buildings. Is that correct? Um, I, 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 you know, I, I'm trying to understand, I guess, but I, you know, for now, I, I accept what you had to say. I mean, there's a lot more accessible technology than loops. There's FM systems, there's infrared systems, there's all kinds of things. Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Yes, so the survey is not just focused on the loop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's actually we're just asking you. It does touch on other accessibility, um, what you use or what you prefer. We're just starting with the loop memo because that was one consumer had reached out several times when flying of ours, um, in regards to that, and we realized, wow, okay, this must not be the we obviously know this is not the only accessible technology available to you like you mentioned so we went ahead to create a survey to address that and to collect more information from all of you um, in regards to the other accessible technology needs um, and what your experience is within dc government buildings based off of that that's our starting point to be able to take action to be able to see as far as the, you know, the DC government buildings, we want to see how, you know, that are there certain things we need to require that we need to advise them on to be able to make modifications. So that's the point of the survey is to have a place to start. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. Okay. So did you, did Jacqueline, did you wanna have an open discussion or? Um, yeah, so we, I think we'll go ahead and take time as far as the survey with comments, um, just following up with, this is more like following up with action and then the results are gonna inform policies that we're going to make from here on out. So the numbers, the statistics, this is all pertinent information to develop policy for this. So this is, we're part of the data collection process right now. We're gathering those numbers and then that's gonna be used. So I think what we'll go ahead and do is open the floor for any comments. I'll okay. ask um, to get those links. So I have a question. Out. Desiree, I'm signing. I don't think you can see me. I keep signing. <laughs> hold on. I'm going to sign. Yep. If you want a voice, just hold on. Okay. Okay. 
Prudence, did you want to say something? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I got confused there for a minute. Okay. Um, I think I might be still a little bit confused about what is an MODDHH event and what are DC government agencies events and the relationship between you. It seems like a complex relationship. It seems like you try to advise no. the other DC it's government not. agencies and maybe some of them look to you for advice. Okay. My my question right. is yes. yes. When another government entity wants to be accessible, like provide their cell interpreters or a card, for example. Are you finding that these other agencies have their own contacts and connections with card providers and interpreters or interpreter agencies? Or do they come to you and you tell them about different card providers or different ASL agencies? If that's clear, I want to know, do all these government entities have their own contracts with interpreter or card agencies, or do you provide that to them? Can you comment on that a little bit, please? Yes, good question. Okay, so um, DC government agencies, um, there's so many of them. Um, I don't know the exact number of how many agencies they have, but it's just a huge amount. The offices, um, we are one office in those within those government agencies. Um, but we are responsible for and we run the effective communication program. And that program itself is responsible for providing accessible accessibility to all DC government agencies, except for the council, DC council, and the DC courts. Okay, so those two are completely um, out of the picture and are out of um the umbrella that we're under. The other DC government agencies, if they want accessibility, they must put in a request. They do not contact us per se. They put in a request. They type in a request, they fill out a form online, and our office, the, our team, the Effective Communications Program team, receives that request, it's received, and then we follow up with any questions, or if there aren't any questions, then we go ahead and put in a request to our um, service providers, or vendors. our vendors. So we contract with three vendors, and the DC government agency fills out that request form. We receive it, we receive the request, and then we send that request. And that's to our, our vendors. To our vendors and that's our process. Now, oftentimes, um, because um, like the training that, like you said, is not required. Many times the government agencies will email us and say, oh, we need um, to put in a request. How do we do that? Um, and and that, that happens often because they still, um, you know, for whether or not it be cart services or whatever it is that they need, they, they're not too, sh um, they haven't put down that request. We will, we'll advise them and kind of like be as like a consultant in providing, like helping them how to go about that process. Um, okay. 
And so now okay, that's good. for have you had, so you do you have it, well, I have a little bit. I have a little bit more to add. Just a, a little bit more to add. Added. Well, do you have formal written contracts with the service providers? Yes. Yes, we do have contracts with three different vendors. Yes. Um, can you expand that list? Prudence, can you repeat that, please, for the interpreter? Can you what? Yes. Okay. You have you have contracts with three. Uh, service provider agencies. Okay, so I'm asking, can you expand the list beyond those three? No. As of now, no. As of now, no, we cannot. Um, it's due to budget um, constraints. Um, we are limited to three vendors. Um, now we again are only, we are open to feedback. If you are not satisfied with those three vendors, um, I believe again um, I don't run that specific program, but uh, um, I believe that each fiscal year we reevaluate our contracts. So the contract is not a forever contract. It does expire. And um, often if we are not satisfied, then we can evaluate um, who we have our contracts with. And we can um, stop our contract if any time if they're not meeting our um, requirements of what's involved in the contract. And if they're not meeting um, or satisfying those needs, then we are able to um, end the contract with them and search for another vendor to contract with. Um, but keep in mind that we do have budget constraints that we have to follow and that that budget um, is not, doesn't allow for us to get, um, sometimes the most qualified interpreters that are needed. Okay. Um, uh, the interpreters um, have about four or five minutes about left. Constraint. Do you pay the vendors up front? Because it seems to me if you have, suppose you have um, five requests for part, for example, I'm just, this is hypothetical, hypothetical. Suppose you have five requests per card. If you send out the request to three, four, five contractual service providers, it doesn't increase the budget three. as to how three, many service three. providers there are. You have five requests. So it's five requests to be filled regardless of if you have one service provider, two service providers. Three service providers, five service providers. Do you understand? Can you clarify that on the budget consideration? Okay. So, yes. Yes. To clarify, we are contracted with three vendors. Okay. And how many service providers each vendor has, I don't know. Um, but each vendor has a budget and we have a um, set budget that is allotted for every fiscal year. That budget is from our office plus the DC government agencies, their budget. And those two budgets then accumulate and become, um, and we use that particular allotment for each government agency has their own budget for communication access. But we are under them. So does that make sense? Does, does that give you a better picture? That we have one, we are uh, one part of a, a larger pot. whole. We have one sure. pot that mm -hmm. we pulled from. Okay. I, I might have to carry this conversation with you later after this meeting, but um but the the cart provision that I've experienced so far, 
There have been three occasions, and so far we're batting zero for three. Okay, so there's there's really a concern about the effectiveness and skill of the vendors with respect to CART. Two minutes. Yes, and that unfortunately, um, we are now part of um, the, the, the advisory committee, which means that you can now work with us to address those concerns. You are part of the advisory committee. Okay. Okay, okay we have a hard stop at four. Um, for our interpreters, we have a hard stop at four. So um, I don't know if we would like to wrap up. Any other comments? Um, I'm going to stop, stop sharing my screen to allow for a few minutes of open discussion before we close. Is that going to be all right? And um, I will be emailing the PowerPoint to everyone and emailing the links as well and everything that we've discussed today. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you for allowing us to share a little bit about ourselves and what we work to do and everything. Um, this is an ongoing collaboration that we have with you all. Um, and uh, feel free to email me. This is Jacqueline um, uh, regarding our safety, emergency preparedness, um, the slides, the resources, anything like that um, that we can help you with. And I will be sending out um, all of the information um, to you all. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Jacqueline. I think we are ap approaching the witching hour. Um, and I, I, I personally have found this very, very interesting and very, very useful. I hope others, and I trust that others have, you know, as well. Um, I also would be remiss if I did not thank Eric, you know, for for the captioning, which the captions were great. Thank you so much. Um, Judy, um, any concluding remarks, you know, but. Um, uh, will we, just to clarify, will we get the current uh, transcript and I would... slides and the extra information Karen and your staff will be providing. Yes. We will get all that later. Uh, cart cart crew is provided by HLAA. We work with us, uh, you know, with, with one particular organization. And Russ, correct me if I'm mistaken, but the transcript is always available. We always send it out to participants. Yes, we will. We will provide a transcript, you know, of, of this conversation, and hopefully, we'll also provide a recording. Um. So yes. Um. Yeah. To to that point, uh, Rachel, you can uh, again clarify this, but our Zoom programs are all on our YouTube channel, and so you can also go there as a reference. Um. Having said that, I would just like to underscore thank you to our cut captionists, the ASL interpreters, uh, to the good questions. I am really appreciative of, of, thank uh, you. of those. Thank you. All. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, of those who uh, are all right. on this. Uh, thank you. This, uh, and this is Sean. Bye-bye. Jacqueline is saying goodbye. Appreciate those who are on the advisory committee. So some of these good questions you know, instead of tabling them because of time can really be explored further. Particularly, my question, you know, would be how do we determine 
uh, quality control of some of these accessibility services that are provided. But that's that's something I put out there for those of you on the committee to entertain. But Karen, thank you and your team very much. Appreciate all the information. Uh, my learning curve is rapidly increasing. And uh, I'm always grateful that you entertain the questions we have to ensure that DC is accessible for all. I agree. I feel the same. I agree. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all so much. Logging off. Cool. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.